time. Two years ago, you saw this creature, an almost extinct animal from Xochimilco, Mexico, called an ajolote, that can regenerate its limbs. You can freeze half the heart, it regrows. You can freeze half the brain, it regrows. It's almost like leaving Congress. <laughs> but now you don't have to have the animal itself to regenerate, because you can build clone mice molars in Petri dishes. And of course, if you can build mice molars in Petri dishes, you can grow human molars in Petri dishes. This should not surprise you, right? I mean, you're born with no teeth. You give away all your teeth to the tooth fairy. You regrow a set of teeth. But then if you lose one of those second set of teeth, they don't regrow unless if you're a lawyer. <laughs> but of course, for most of us, we know how to grow teeth, and therefore we can take adult stem teeth, put them on a biodegradable mold, regrow a tooth, and simply implant it. And we can do it with other things. So a Spanish woman who was dying of TB had a donor trachea. They took all the cells off the trachea. They spray painted her stem cells onto that cartilage. She regrew her own trachea, and 72 hours later, it was implanted. She's now running around with her kids. This is going on in Tony Atala's lab in Wake Forest, where he's regrowing ears for injured soldiers, and he's also regrowing bladders. So there are now nine women walking around Boston with regrown bladders, which is much more pleasant than walking around with a whole bunch of plastic bags the rest of your life. This is kind of getting boring, right? I mean, you understand where the story is going. But it gets more interesting. Last year, this group was able to take all the cells off a heart leaving just the cartilage. Then they sprayed stem cells onto that heart from a mouse. Those stem cells self-organized, and that heart started to beat. Life happens. This may be one of the ultimate papers. This was done in Japan and in the US, published at the same time. And it rebooted skin cells into stem cells last year. That means that you can take the stuff right here and turn it into almost anything in your body. And this is becoming common. It's moving very quickly. It's moving in a whole series of places. Third trend, robots. Those of us of a certain age grew up expecting that by now we would have Rosie the robot from the Jetsons in our house. And all we've got is a Roomba. <laughs> we also thought we'd have this robot to warn us of danger. Didn't happen. These were robots engineered for a flat world, right? So Rosie ran on skates, and the other one ran on flat threads. If you don't have a flat world, that's not good, which is why the robots we're designing today are a little different. This is Boston Dynamics' Big Dog. And this is about as close as you can get to a physical Turing test. Okay, so let me remind you, a Turing test is where you've got a wall you're talking to somebody on the other side of the wall, and when you don't know if that thing is human or animal, that's when computers have reached human intelligence. This is not an intelligence Turing test, but this is as close as you can get to a physical Turing test. And this stuff is moving very quickly, and by the way, that thing can carry about 350 pounds of weight. These are not the only interesting robots. You've also got flies, the size of flies, that are being made by Robert Wood at Harvard. You've got sticky bots that are being made at Stanford. And as you bring these things together, as you bring cells, biological tissue engineering, and mechanics together, you begin to get some really odd questions. In the last Olympics, this gentleman, who had several world records in the Special Olympics, tried to run in the normal Olympics. The only issue with Oscar Pistorius is he was born without bones in the lower part of his legs. He came within about a second of qualifying. He sued to be allowed to run, and he won the suit, but didn't qualify by time. Next Olympics, you can bet that Oscar or one of Oscar's successors is going to make the time. And two or three Olympics after that, they are going to be unbeatable. And as you bring these trends together, and as you think of what it means to take people who are profoundly deaf, who can now begin to hear, I mean, remember the evolution of hearing aids, right? I mean, your grandparents had these great big cones, and then your parents had these odd boxes that would squawk at odd times during dinner. 
And now we have these little buds that nobody sees. And now you have cochlear implants that go into people's heads and allow the deaf to begin to hear. Now, they can't hear as well as you and I can, but in 10 or 15 machine generations, they will. And these are machine generations, not human generations. And about two or three years after they can hear as well as you and I can, then they'll be able to hear maybe how bats sing or how whales talk or how dogs talk and other types of tonal scales. They'll be able to focus their hearing. They'll be able to increase the sensitivity, decrease the sensitivity, do a series of things that we can't do. And the same thing is happening in eyes. This is a group in Germany that's beginning to engineer eyes so that people who are blind can begin to see light and dark. Very primitive. And then they'll be able to see shape. And then they'll be able to see color. And then they'll be able to see indefinition. And one day, they'll see as well as you and I can. And a couple of years after that, they'll be able to see an ultraviolet. They'll be able to see an infrared. They'll be able to focus their eyes. They'll be able to come into a micro focus. They'll do stuff you and I can't do. All of these things are coming together. And it's a particularly important thing to understand as we worry about the flames of the present to keep an eye on the future. And of course, the future is looking back 200 years, because next week is the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth. And it's the 150th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of the Species. And Darwin, of course, argued that evolution is a natural state. It is a natural state in everything that is alive, including hominids. There have actually been 22 species of hominids that have been around have evolved, have wandered in different places, and have gone extinct. It is common for hominids to evolve. And that's the reason why, as you look at the hominid fossil record, Erectus and Heidelbergensis and Florensis and Neanderthals and Homo sapiens all overlapped. The common stage of affairs is to have overlapping versions of hominids, not one. And as you think of the implications of that, here's a brief history of the universe. The universe was created 13.7 billion years ago. And then you created all the stars and all the planets and all the galaxies and all the Milky Ways. And then you created Earth about 4.5 billion years ago. And then you got life about 4 billion years ago. And then you got hominids about 0.006 billion years ago. And then you got our version of hominids about 0.0015 billion years ago. Ta-da! Maybe the reason for the creation of the universe and all the galaxies and all the plants and all the energy and all the dark energy and the rest of the stuff is to create what's in this room. Maybe not. That would be a mildly arrogant viewpoint. So if that's not the purpose of the universe, then what's next? <laughs> and I think what we're going to see is we're going to see a different species of a hominid. I think we're going to move from a Homo sapiens into a Homo evolutus. And I think this isn't a thousand years out. I think most of us are going to glance at it, and our grandchildren are going to begin to live it. And a Homo evolutus brings together these three trends into a hominid that takes direct and deliberate control over the evolution of his species, her species, and other species. And that, of course, would be the ultimate reboot. Thank you very much. <laughs>